Today, MakerDAO has over $8 billion of TVL, and at one point, it even had over around $20 billion in TVL in the protocol. So, of course, being one of the literally largest DeFi protocols ever to exist, what is MakerDAO? What does it do? And how does it work, right? How does it actually maintain its the peg of the DAI stablecoin? And how does that actually sort of work out? Well, that is exactly what we want to understand today. This is what's going to help you understand different types of DeFi protocols drawing from the fundamentals that come from protocols like MakerDAO, which are collateralized debt position protocols. But of course, before we dive into things here, my name is Owen and over a year and a half ago, I founded Guardian Audits. And ever since then, we've uncovered easily over 100, perhaps even 200 unique, critical and high vulnerabilities in dozens and dozens of different types of DeFi protocols, some of which being collateralized debt position protocol. And my goal with all of the videos that I create, and especially this one, is to distill down all of my experience, all of the, the knowledge gained from over probably at this point, 2000 hours, maybe even 3000 hours at this point, spent auditing smart contracts and give it to you so that you can ultimately become a much, much better smart contract security researcher or blockchain developer or whatever you're looking to be in a fraction of the time. All right, with that out of the way, let's get into the MakerDAO protocol. All right, fantastic. So I've got the magical whiteboard here pulled up. And of course, that is because today we want to understand, first of all, what does MakerDAO do? And then we want to understand how does it do it, right? So of course, you, you probably know if you're, if you're clicking onto this video, you probably already know that what does MakerDAO do? They do DAI, right? And DAI is a collateralized and over collateralized stable coin. We'll get into exactly what that means, but it's basically just a, a, a token on chain that is roughly pegged to one US dollar, right? So, so that is the product of MakerDAO. This is how MakerDAO has, you know, achieved at one point in time, almost $20 billion of TVL locked up in the protocol just to produce this stable coin on, on chain. Okay. So of course, how do we do this? How do we make one die, right? So in the MakerDAO protocol, what you have to do is you have to provide collateral, right? And you, and you don't just have to provide $1 of collateral to get $1 of die. What we're going to require is that, for example, if you're providing ETH as collateral, then we have a collateralization ratio. And for ETH, this could be something like 1.5. What does this mean? This means that if I give you $1.5 worth of ether. So if I take $1.5 worth of ether and give it to the MakerDAO protocol, then I will be able to withdraw up to or, or borrow up to $1 or really just one die, which is, you know, roughly pegged to $1. And the way that you do this is by creating a vault or like they call in their actual smart contract code and earn and we'll we'll get into their their sort of you know wacky naming in just a second here but you create a vault i like to call them positions just you know as they're they're normally referenced in in most DeFi protocols so from this point forward we'll be talking and referring to them as positions you could call this an a vault you could call this an urn you could call this really whatever you want to i'm going to call them positions for the rest of this video so you create a position and the most amount, the, the most die that you can borrow given this $1.5 worth of ETH is just this single die. You can't borrow any more of it. And in fact, often you're going to want to borrow a lot less than the maximum. Otherwise, you will get what's called liquidated, which we will talk about in just a second. So, of course, this raises the question, why would anybody do this, right? Why would I put $1.5 in and only be able to borrow $1 out, right? That doesn't seem very financially effective, right? Well, first of all, we'll, we'll talk about the constraints and exactly why it has to be that way in a second. But 
Second of all, it is actually still attractive and it is still useful to be able to do this, right? We can talk about a few situations. So firstly, if I want to buy, you know, let's say I want to go buy a MacBook or something like this, but I'm holding a bunch of ETH and I think ETH is going to go up, right? And, and I don't want to sell my ETH to go buy a new MacBook, but I really want that MacBook. So what I can do is if I have, let's say, 10 ETH, and let's say that the, the price of ETH is $5,000, as it will be very soon, then I've got you know $50,000 of value here, and I can go ahead and I can deposit this 10 Ether into the MakerDAO protocol. So I take my 10 ETH here, and now I can draw against it. So with this $50,000, if I divide this by 1.5, then that means that I have a maximum of roughly $33,000 that I can borrow worth of DAI. So I just need a MacBook. I don't need anything crazy, right? So, so I'm just going to borrow, let's say, 2,000 DAI against my 10 ETH, right? So what I've done is I have put down 10 ETH into the MakerDAO protocol and I've taken out 2,000 die. So if we actually go ahead and draw out, let's say here's MakerDAO. We have the big M here. It's not McDonald's, it's Maker. And we put in 10 ETH as collateral. Now we can get our collateral back at any time. We just have to repay what we borrowed, which was 2,000 die. Of course, what I do with my 2,000 die is maybe I'll go swap it to something like USDC and then I'll take it off chain and I'll go to Apple and I'll get my, my Mac, right? And so I still have exposure to this 10 ETH. It's still within my ownership technically. I just have to pay back what I've borrowed here, this 2000 I to be able to withdraw all of my 10 ETH again, right? But my 10 ETH stays as 10 ETH, right? So if ETH goes from $5,000 to $10,000, which is going to happen soon. And it's going to happen very, very soon. Then I still have exposure to this move and I still own this, this 10 ETH. I just have to pay back 2000. I basically have a hundred thousand dollars now in this 10 ETH and I didn't have to sell some of my ETH. So I would have had to sell, you know, like a, a, a third of an ETH or, or something like that to be able to go buy this Mac. But I didn't want to sell ETH at $5,000 because I, I knew, I just knew that it was going to go to $10,000. So knowing that, instead, put down my, my 10 ETH into the MakerDAO protocol as collateral, take out the 2,000, go buy the Mac. And I actually have a very low collateralization ratio here. So this is actually, you know, pretty much a, a, a pretty safe borrow to do. I'm not going to, be at risk of getting liquidated. So we can actually calculate my collateralization ratio here. And we can find that it is, so 10 ETH at the current price of ETH, this is worth $50,000. If we divide that by the amount that I borrowed, the value of that is $2,000. So what we get here is a collateralization ratio of 25 right well that is certainly greater than the required collateralization ratio of 1.5 right so so this is a completely safe position i am at no risk of going below the collateralization ratio of 1.5 here and really quickly we won't go too too far in depth on this but one strategy that you could also use something like a maker dow protocol for is this idea of looping that is really just awful, awful handwriting, but we're going to go with it. So looping works in, so we're going to do the same thing to start. Let's say I have, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and copy this. So we'll, we'll bring this over here, put this right here. So what we do is I, let's say I still have my 10 ether, put it in, then we can go ahead and we'll remove that. Let's say now based on my 10 ether, that's $50,000. What if I go ahead and let's just say I take out and I let's say I do something that is, you know, not well advised 
and I take out actually, you know, thirty thousand dollars, which is you know a lot. It's a it's at a high collateralization ratio. I'm almost at that one point five collateralization ratio there. Now what I can do is I can actually go and I can buy with this. I can buy six more ETH, right? Because the the current price of ETH is five thousand dollars. So I'm going to take this thirty thousand dollars, turn it into six ether, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to put it back into MakerDAO and I'm going to add more collateral. So instead of just having ten here, now we've got sixteen. And so what I can do now is I've got more collateral. I can borrow a little bit more, right? So for this six ether that I just deposited, I can add a collateralization rate that is less than one point five. I can borrow that amount more, so I can go and I can say, okay, now I want to take. I just put in six ETH, which was thirty thousand dollars worth of collateral. Now I want to come and I want to take out something like like twenty thousand. And now, so what I can do is I can I can now take this twenty thousand. I can turn this into four ETH, and I can take this four ETH, and I can deposit it back into. My position, and I'm up to 20 ETH as collateral, and so you can continue to loop and loop and loop like this until you essentially have, at the end, you know, basically no more room to to go until you're basically liquidated and you're so levered up that you know as soon as the price of ETH drops even just a little bit, then your entire position just get, goes basically liquidatable. And so this is a way to basically be leveraged. Long ETH, right? So I initially had 10, 10 ether, but now I'm exposed to the price changes of 20 ether, right? So if the price of ETH goes up, now instead of being exposed to it with just 10 ether, I'm exposed to it with 20 ether. So that's just a, a high-level overview of another interesting thing that you can do with these kind of protocols. Okay, but of course the question of the day is. How does one die? So, how does one die? Maintain its peg to one dollar, right? That is the the question, right? And that and that's really what the entire MakerDAO protocol is designed to do, right? So, there are a few things to to talk about here. So, first of all, we'll talk about the stability fees, the die savings rate, and The debt ceiling, as some some configurations, some ways to sort of manage the peg, and then we'll talk about on top of that maybe even some some even stronger incentives to main the, maintain the peg after that. But before we get to that, we've got stability fees, die savings rate, and the debt ceiling here. All right, so the stability fees. This is essentially, you know. What interest rate I have to pay when I borrow die, right? So, so when you get a loan from a bank or something like this, then you've got to pay interest, right? Otherwise, they're just kind of giving you money today and letting you earn yield on it or do whatever opportunity you have without getting anything in return, right? Which isn't really financially. Feasible doesn't make sense, right? So stability fees are the interest rate that we charge you on the loan when you borrow die, and so this is just one lever that the protocol has at its disposal to control whether or not the price of die increases or decreases. And really, this this comes down to fundamental economics, right? So if we have the the supply and demand curve here, so here's demand and here is supply. Then, if the price of die is too low, then what we can do is we can increase the stability fees. We can increase the interest rate that people have to pay when they when they have die that is borrowed. And so, what is that going to do? That's going to mean that if I am borrowing die currently, I want to pay it back so that I have to stop paying a really high stability fee. Right? You can imagine if we. Jacked it up to like 50% per year that you've got to pay. <laughs> Nobody would want to pay that, right? I don't know any investment. Well, I mean, we are in crypto, so perhaps yes, you can outpace 50% per year. But most people, most sane people, will go ahead and, and return their die, right? 
So when you pay back your, your borrow amount for DAI, that just removes that DAI from the market, right? So what does that do? That takes the supply curve and it shifts it to the left, right? So we can see that the intersection here, which is going to be price, is going to rise up, right? As we shift this curve to the left, we can see that is basically rising, right? So that's the, the lever that stability fees offer, right? And of course, if we need to lower the price, then we can lower the stability fees. If it was a 0% interest rate, which is, you know, essentially what the Fed did in the, in the, in the recent years is they just lowered the, the interest rate of borrowing from the central bank to, to zero, then of course, we're going to be able to increase the supply of DAI, right? So you can see the, the price of DAI decreases then. And that is basically inflation, right? All right, now let's talk about the DAI savings rate. So this is how much I can earn passively from my DAI if I deposit it in a smart contract. So there's a smart contract that you can essentially deposit your DAI into and just earn this savings rate, right? Now, it's not necessarily locked for any period of time, but just by way of having an incentive for people to hold on to it, they're not going to sell it, right? You only earn that incentive while you aren't selling it, right? If you actually have it, then you're earning it. If you've sold it, you don't have it and you're not earning it, right? So so this is similarly, you could, you could almost argue that this affects both the demand and the supply curve. So demand and supply. You could argue that if we increase the, the savings rate, really what it will do is it will increase the demand. So the demand curve could, would shift to the right and that would go ahead and, and rise the price, raise the price because people are saying like, okay, wow, there's a 10%. If I could get a 10% yield on DAI, well, I'm going to buy that. I'm going to buy that and put it in the smart contract and get 10%. And then of course, you know, you might also say that, well, if people are putting it in this contract and therefore they're not selling it, then it's quote unquote off the market per se. And so that would be, uh, you know, similar to shifting the supply to the left, right? And so both of those will, will increase the price. And then of course you can reduce the savings rate if you need to lower the price, if die is above $1, et cetera, et cetera. And then the debt ceiling is just a cap on how much die can be borrowed, right? So, so that's just a, a, a knob that says, you know, we're, we're just literally not even gonna let more than this amount of die be borrowed for this type of collateral or something like this, right? So these are just three different levers that the protocol has at its disposal that can be controlled by the maker governance token that will help the, the die stablecoin hold peg. But there are some, you know, possibly even more immediate ways that the die stablecoin holds its peg, right? Because these effects can can take time, right? They don't happen immediately. So first of all, let's let's examine the scenario where one die is actually worth more than one dollar. Let's just say, for example, one die equals one point Oh, five dollars. So one dollar and five cents. That's the current price of die. So what people are incentivized to do then is come and come to the the Maker DAO protocol and deposit some collateral so that they can borrow some die, and then they can they can sell the die at the the higher price here, right? So you're borrowing based on your collateral, but you're borrowing based on you know one die is worth x amount of collateral but that isn't that ratio right there doesn't change depending on whatever the the market is accepting for die right now so you borrow based on that ratio and then you can sell on the market and basically have you know just be able to to borrow die and sell at this higher price this price that is above one dollar and then similarly if we consider the case where one die is actually less than one dollar so if one die is equal to 95 cents or something like this so 0.95 if it's less than a dollar well then 
if I have a, a position where I've previously borrowed DAI, so I have debt and the debt has to be repaid in DAI, well, that's awesome for me. I'm going to come to the Maker DAO protocol and I'm going to pay back my debt. I'm going to buy up DAI off the market at 95 cents and I'm going to buy, pay back my debt that was previously borrowed when DAI was $1, right? So I'm getting a discount on my debt right now. And then if I, I want to pay it all back, then I can go ahead and just remove all my collateral and my collateral is free. My debt has been paid back and I didn't even have to pay the dollar per die to pay back my debt. I got a 5% discount on my debt basically. And so that's essentially how the peg is more tightly held in addition to some of these scenarios here where you know you can sort of change configurations in order to modify the price of die over a longer term basis. And finally, of course, how, how do we ensure that die has this relationship where one die is equal to ideally at least one dollar of debt, right? So how do we make sure that that this relationship stays true and so that people are they're always excited to be able to come and come back and pay 95 cents when die is if it ever goes below peg to be able to pay back one dollar value of debt right as long as this is true then this will always be a great deal to pay back that debt and of course this is why we have the idea of over collateralization if we are over collateralized then we have a buffer a margin of safety to where we can always say that yes we can comfortably assure you that for every die that you pay back, there is $1 of debt that gets unlocked. And so the definition of that would be exactly a collateralization rate of one. So collateralization rate of one, that's exactly what the protocol needs to function at a baseline level. But of course, if you just had a collateralization rate of one, then what would happen is positions would get right to like 1.01 .01, and then price would, you know, there'd be some scam wick and it would go, it would go down to like 0.98. And then all of a sudden the position is insolvent, right? Now we can no longer guarantee that for every $1 of, of borrow value, there's $1 of back in collateral. And then what you have is, well, the, the person, the owner of that position would much rather just walk off with the borrowed amount, which is, you know, if they borrowed $1,000 versus the collateral that they have, which is now worth $980, right? So then if you liquidate them, then there's literally not enough money to cover the borrowed amount, which is $1,000, because they've only got $980 worth of, of collateral. And so that's why this line right here of, of one to one, this is not the liquidation threshold, right? Because as soon as you cross this threshold, there's issues for the protocol, right? This gap between my fingers here, this delta, that is losses that the protocol will directly experience if a liquidation happens with a gap like this. So what we do is we take this threshold here, which is the liquidation threshold, and we raise it up so that it's actually much higher than the $1 borrowed equals $1 of collateral. It is actually, you know, $1 borrowed equals $1.5 of collateral. This is where our collateralization ratio comes in. And now as the value of collateral goes right underneath that, now, instead of going from $1,000 to $980 and then getting liquidated insolvently, we might go from $1,510 to $1,480. And so we still got more than $1,000 to come and pay our borrowed amount back. And that's entirely because we had this extra $500 worth of buffer room. That's where the, the 1.5 comes in. And that protects the protocol from ever having to take on a loss because they liquidated the position and the position just straight up didn't have enough money in its collateral to pay back what it borrowed. So really the, the whole reason that we assign a collateralization ratio of greater than one, you know, in the case that we've been talking about here of 1.5 is because we want that buffer zone for, you know, we're not going to liquidate them at exactly the right price or something like that. Oftentimes price can gap below 
or you know liquidators might be delayed or something like this so we need that extra 0.5 buffer to allow us to have time and to be able to liquidate the person while they still have enough collateral to cover their borrowed amount now of course even with a certain buffer it is still technically possible for liquidations to occur where we gap from let's say a thousand dollars borrowed that would put the liquidation threshold using our 1.5 collateralization ratio of it would put it at fifteen hundred dollars now technically it could still be possible for a liquidation to only occur after the collateral goes from you know initially like 1550 and then you know for whatever reason liquidation just doesn't happen until the collateral is worth 950 right it should have happened it should have happened ideally at you know like 1499 it should have happened exactly at that moment right but for whatever reason liquidation delayed we only get 950 now we've got to pay back one thousand dollars but we only have nine hundred and fifty dollars and so that leaves us with fifty dollars of bad debt that the protocol has to take on itself right the person who opened the position they their collateral didn't pay for it they just walked away with the thousand dollars they borrowed you took my nine hundred and fifty dollars that's okay good deal for me bad deal for the protocol what does MakerDAO do in this situation well what will happen is the flopper <laughs> Yes, literally the flopper will mint and sell maker, the, the governance token for die to be able to cover that loss, right? So we'll, we'll go a little bit deeper on exactly what this works and we'll actually walk through an example of liquidations here. But first, yes, I did just say flopper. So a quick aside on the naming. If we actually go into the, the maker DAO code base, you can see that the naming is, you know, notoriously hard to understand. Right. You, we can see we've got the I'm just in the the VAT here, the VAT contract. We can see there's a FROB function which accepts I, U, V, W, Dink and Dart. So you try telling me what that does. And you can see where we're dealing with ilk. We're dealing with DTAB and all of these things. Right. So the MakerDAO code base is famous or I guess you could say infamous for having just these uh, really short terse names for their variables here that, you know, maybe sometimes give an intuition of what the thing is doing. For example, the, the urn is like your, your vault or your position. Another example is the dog is a contract that is used to liquidate people with the bark function. So you might ask yourself, why, <laughs> why, just why? Right. And, and th this is the same question I was asking myself when I first opened the code base. And essentially the, the answer is, first of all, to, you know, remove verbosity, to have really short, you know, names instead of having really long verbose names. Another answer is that, you know, it, it's easier to formalize. So to actually go through and, and formally verify these contracts, which has been done to prove out some of the core fundamental equations that basically guarantee the, the functioning and the security of the protocol. It's a lot easier, one could say, to do that when you have these sort of abstract names for things. And also it sort of removes your assumptions that you have when you come into a code base. So when I see the function bark, really that's a liquidation function, but I wouldn't know that until I spent an excessive amount of time, really, to understand everything here. So, you know, there are trade-offs with that, right? You come in and, and you don't have any assumptions, but then again, you also don't get to glean any efficiency from understanding stuff immediately, right? So a review will just take a lot more time, but it could come with less blind spots. Me personally, I find it quite annoying, but I also haven't spent 30, 40, 50 plus hours looking at the code base. Maybe it's a lot easier and a lot nicer to, to think about once you understand the mappings for each of the different sort of you know function names contracts and variables etc cetera, etc cetera. okay so now that we've done that quick aside on the naming how exactly do liquidations work and then what exactly does this you know uh, insolvent case look like right so first of all we've established that once you cross the liquidation threshold you are able to be liquidated or i guess <laughs> you are able to be barked right with the with the dog contract 
So what happens when you are liquidated? Well, first of all, what we're going to do is let's say we have a situation where the price of ETH is $3,000, right? And let's say that I deposit, so deposit, let's just make this wider, deposit one ETH into Maker. So we could borrow up to 2,000 DAI, right? So if we wanted to have a complete uh, up to our maximum collateralization ratio, we could borrow 2,000 DAI, and that would put us at a 1.5 collateralization ratio, but we'll only borrow 1,000 DAI. We'll, we'll play it safe and we'll keep it at a collateralization ratio of three, which is greater than 1.5, so it is a completely solvent position. It's, it's not even at risk of getting liquidated. So we've, we've borrowed 1,000 DAI. Now let's say price of ether drops to $1,400, right? So now our collateral is worth 1,400. Now we divide that by our 1,000 borrowed DAI, and that equals 1.4, which is less than the 1.5 collateralization ratio. So now all of a sudden we are able to be liquidated or barked. Okay, so first of all, somebody will call the dog.bark function and you can actually see they can supply a, a keeper address here. This is the address that will actually receive a reward, a small incentive, if there's one that's configured for just calling the liquidation, right? Because we want these liquidations to occur. And that reward actually scales with the size of the borrow amount, the, the amount of debt that I have that make sure that liquidations occur promptly, right? We don't want price to be able to move down drastically before liquidation happens. We want them to happen right away and be very reactive to the market price. So what happens is we take, so the, the MakerDAO protocol will take my one ETH and auction it off. It will auction it off in a Dutch auction. So a quick aside on a Dutch auction, what will happen is we will start off the auction Let's say if this is time here, and this is price here, then the price will start high, and then it will trend down with time. And there are all sorts of different you know, functions and curves that have been experimented with, but generally the price will trend downwards with time, right? So as the auction starts, if you, if you bid up here, then you're not gonna get as good of a price as if you wait and you bid here. But then of course, that amount of tokens might not be left at that time, right? So it's kind of this, you know, game theory scenario of, you know, when exactly do you wanna to bid to, to get the best price, stuff like that, right? So they'll take my one ETH and they'll auction it off just like that. And as soon as they get, so as soon as they raise from the auction enough die to, pay back my losses, or not my not my losses in this case, my, my borrow amount, my borrow plus plus a, a liquidation fee that gets taken. So they're gonna they're gonna end up selling a little bit more of my collateral just to cover a liquidation fee. And that's to disincentivize from people actually getting into a liquidatable state because it's you know generally just not something that is great for the protocol to have really risky positions that get liquidated so there should be a disincentive to actually do this it shouldn't just be like a okay we're gonna close your position we're gonna take a thousand dollars from you you've borrowed a thousand dollars so you're like ah uh, right they should take a thousand and fifty you only got to borrow a thousand and so therefore your net loss there is fifty you know something like that and then after that has been that amount of die has been raised from selling my collateral, whatever collateral is left over after we've raised the necessary amount of die is sent back to me. So leftover collateral sent back to me. And by the way, I am the owner of the position that was liquidated here. And that is the end of the liquidation, right? My, my position has been closed, my debt has been paid back, and whatever remaining collateral after covering the liquidation fee after paying back my debt has been sent back to me. Now, of course, what happens if in the auction, for some reason, we aren't able to raise enough die to fully pay back my borrow amount, right? So this is 
the what is most commonly known as just an insolvent liquidation. And honestly, in almost any DeFi protocol, you should be looking for this edge case just to see what happens, right? So this is just any liquidation where the collateral is not sufficient to pay back the borrow amount to cover the losses, et cetera, et cetera, depending on the DeFi protocol you're looking at. In the MakerDAO system, what happens is that amount of bad debt that wasn't able to be covered by collateral will be formalized as SIN in the VAL contract, in this contract here. And I will spare you the the details of, of going through, you know, these different functions here. We have flog, heal, kiss, flop, flap, <laughs> cage, et cetera, et cetera. So, oh, that's a good one there, fess. <laughs> so what will happen is when it's formalized as sin and it gets tracked in this contract here, we can see sin right here is this deck queue. Then ultimately what will happen is we will go to the flopper contract here and we will kick and we will tick and we will dent <laughs> and deal and new maker will be essentially sold to to raise this die and then that can be used to cover the losses there and of course maker like we said earlier is the governance token of the maker dow protocol and of course if everything is functioning correctly if the risk parameters have been set correctly if liquidations are occurring as they should be then Maker shouldn't have to be sold to cover these losses as there should be no insolvency losses in general. But of course, on the other hand, if the protocol is functioning well, then a lot of DAI should actually build up as an excess in the VAL contract. And this will come from those stability fees that get paid out over time. And above a certain configured threshold, what will happen is those additional DAI will be used to basically buy back Maker off the market and burn it so that MakerDAO price goes up. And that way it is actually a good token to hold if the protocol is functioning correctly, which gives an incentive for large holders of the Maker token to vote and propose proposals that will actually be good for the risk management of the system. All right, and that is essentially everything that you need to know about the, the MakerDAO protocol, about how DAI works, about you know how DAI is created, why we need these liquidations with a collateralization ratio, how liquidations work, and all sorts of stuff. And so I hope that this made this whole protocol quite clear to you and you can understand this concept of liquidations and collateralization and, and it, things like this. All right, and of course, finally, if you're really interested in this DeFi stuff, you're interested in Web3 smart contract security, and you'd like to connect with other smart contract security researchers from across the world, and you know, share your approach or ask questions to folks who are also digging into this at the same time, then go ahead and join our free community of smart contract security researchers at lab.guardianaudits.com. All right, that is all for this time. I look forward to seeing you in the next one.